Uh, that so I was saying that we last week started with the key motivation of explainable AI being the statement which is pretty vague, uh, being something like increasing the trust of users and AI, and then we worked our way to trying to make that uh, definition more precise. And we have defined a trustworthy model, meaning a model that can, uh, given some contract, where contract is not you know, your legal definition of a contract, but rather any functionality you deem to be important. If your model is capable of maintaining that contract, we said it's trustworthy. So it's important to remember that when we talk about trustworthiness, it's a property of a model. On the other hand, if uh, the human trust in AI is obviously something a person has, mm -hmm. and we say that the person um, has a human trust in AI contractually, if uh, this person perceives that AI model is trustworthy in that contract and accepts vulnerability to its actions, I all have also said to have the second um, option you know, um, fulfilled, we do need to um, have some undesirable event that can possibly, but not certainly uh, occur. And we also must have this person um, being aware of this possibility of this event uh, happening. And only then this person can accept vulnerability to this action. Uh, otherwise we cannot talk about trust. So if there is no risk in this paper, we say we cannot talk about uh, trust. Uh, definition of human distrust in AI can be defined uh, similarly. Um, basically, if one of these things doesn't happen, then we have distrust in AI. Um, and then I talked about how your model can be trustworthy, great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your uh, trust uh, from your person will happen. So we defined warranted trust, and that's trust that is caused by AI is trustworthiness. So if you have trustworthy model causing trust in AI, then we talk about warranted trust and otherwise we talk about unwarranted trust. Uh, for example, if your nice uh, interface and flashing model is causing the person to trust your AI, but your AI is not really trustworthy with respect to certain contract, then we are talking about unwarranted trust in AI. So for example, we know that um, these models these days, such as ChatGPT, can produce uh, information that doesn't actually exist. Uh, and we talk about this, um, we term this behavior hallucinations. Um, some researchers at Stanford have studied how often does this happen if they give them uh, queries about healthcare. And I said it happens with about rate of 6%. So 6% of their queries will cause the model to just start producing something that's completely outside of the knowledge known to the world. And it, it's bizarre, it doesn't make sense. Um, so if you say that your contract is the model should not co uh, generate any information that's made up, and if you as a person developing the course contract say, well, if there is more than 1% of hallucination, I deem that this contract is not maintained, then ChatGPT would not maintain this contract. And if people trust ChatGPT just because it looks really nice and pleasant and it's easy to interact with, which really happens, then we would talk about unwarranted trust of, uh, in ChatGPT um, and the um, the ChatGPT would be um, unwarranted. Uh, here, the ChatGPT would be untrustworthy to a specific contract of hallucination. Okay, and this uh, warranted distrust and unwarranted distrust can be uh, defined very uh, similarly. Okay, so this is all we talked about last time. Any questions about this? Um, very good. Okay, so. When with all these definitions in mind, we revised that very vague uh, motivation for introducing explainability. And we said that instead of saying just the sentence, a key motivation of explainable AI is to increase the trust of users in AI, we should instead say that the motivation is to increase the trustworthiness of AI, the trust of the user in trustworthy AI, increasing the distrust of the user in a non-trustworthy AI property, where she is really often, or motivation that's often forgotten. And all of this has to be done corresponding to a stated contract. And the goal is that user develops warranted trust or distrust in that contract. Okay, so way more wordy than just one sentence, but it's really necessary if you want to talk about something concrete rather than something very vague. So now, um, today, I want to talk about which factors enable people to trust trustworthy models. I will continue um, 
deriving some of the definitions from the same paper I have started with last time. Um, and then I will show you some uh, issues with actually um, doing evaluations with one. This will be probably a little bit more um, kind of different lectures than we had before, because it's not going to be specific about the generation of local explanations, meaning explanations of individual predictions, rather about evaluations of models in general, something more globally. So it's going to be, it might feel like a little digression, but it all feels, uh, not feels, it all is part of this uh, whole story about human trust uh, in AI. Okay, so um, there are two categories, broad categories of causes of warranted trust. And uh, we can divide them into intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic trust is in a, in a model that's truly trustworthy, is based on observing inner workings of that uh, model. And to give you an analogy with human to human interaction, you can think about a doctor who is citing respectable sources uh, to its patient, to their patient, excuse me. And let's imagine that the patients do want respectable studies, not something uh, weird and made up on the internet. This would be how we can increase intrinsic trust. On the other hand, we can uh, have uh, trust and we call coin this trust extrinsic trust in a trustworthy model if you if it's based on observing external behaviors. So this can be again to give you an analogy with human to human interaction. This can be when a doctor um, has uh, completed a very rigorous examination program and you know that uh, rigorous examination program or you have this doctor might have a long history of making a uh, correct uh, diagnosis. Okay, so these are two categories of how um, trust in a war in a warranted trust in a trustworthy model may uh, happen. All right, and so I want to talk more first about the uh, extrinsic trust, how we can um, how it can be gained and how we can evaluate it. So if we, uh, I said that. Um, I gave you an analogy of a doctor who graduated from an institution that has a rigorous program. So now we can uh, define maybe potentially a rigorous program for an AI. You have a very rigorous examination and knowing that the AI model had passed that rigorous examination might incur extrinsic trust uh, in, the, in that model. And today, uh, the White has, has released uh, a number of things that a safe model should do. So we kind of have already set up for the things that must, you know, that our examination should cover for us to have this kind of uh, trust. Uh, I really encourage you to check that out. It's really relevant. I will post a link on Piazza as well. And we, if we have time, I can even open it and we can uh, discuss it. Okay, so if a rigorous examination is our tool to achieve extrinsic trust, that's good because natural language processing as a field has for a number of years built benchmarks with the goal of testing the degree to which models do some specific task in NLP, some language task in some slice of a specific domain. So some language variety in some topical domain. And there are three properties that these benchmarks must have. They must be comprehensive in their coverage. If you are uh, saying, okay, I'm going to test whether my model can um, deal with, I don't know, negation, but you, specific, uh, you collect only occurrences of negation that are expressed with word not, that's not the comprehensive uh, coverage of variation of that phenomenon. You also need to isolate all necessary task skills. So what kind of skills are needed to deal with that phenomena? Again, picking on the case of negation, because I know it better. You want to maybe test the way that negation is expressed, what is in the scope of negation, and whether it was present or not. So you are isolating the necessary skills, and you want all of them to the best extent of your ability to develop that benchmark to to include as many as many of them. Sorry, that sentence didn't really make sense. Um, and finally, you want to develop benchmarks such that if you have trained test split of that data in that benchmark, and you train the model on the training data of you, the that you have developed, you want it to be hard 
for the models to be correct for the wrong reasons in these uh, data sets. Meaning, remember those data shortcuts, and I'll come to data shortcuts in a moment. You just want to avoid collecting data with systematic gaps where models can pick on shortcuts that are not really how they should be solving the task. So good thing, coming back to extrinsic trust, we need rigorous examinations. And look, there is a whole field that is doing a bunch of these for a while. The, the problem is that developing proper rigorous benchmarks is really hard. So in the paper, we say extrinsic human trust in AI is gained when the model is trustworthy. And the evaluation scheme is such that it's only possible for the AI to pass the evaluation if it's capable of maintaining that contract. So you, you really want that examination to test uh, what we are after here. And I will go over a bunch of examples that um, prevent us to achieve something like this. I will show you why it's really hard to really confidently say that the benchmark we are building is, um, is such that the AI can pass its evaluation only if it's capable of maintaining the contract. Okay, any questions about all of that? All right, so I will go over a couple of issues and please stop me if you have any questions. It would be great if this is, you know, um, if, if we can discuss about these things and if you find anything surprising, feel free to just say so. Um, otherwise, I will just continue over the uh, few items in the list. I think I have four specific things uh, uh, for the challenges of the valid benchmarks. So the first one is data shortcuts, which are, you are familiar by now. We have read one of the papers called, can you find these shortcuts or something along those lines? So that shouldn't be unfamiliar, but just in case I'm gonna go uh, over it one, once again, um, we keep coming back to this task of natural language inference because the data collected for it called SNLI has a lot of these artifacts. The task is given a hypothesis, like the sentence on the right here, uh, to determine is this sentence true, false, or neither, given this premise uh, alone. So knowing that there are three dogs on a trace trace, excuse me, racetrack, you should say that this contradicts that there are three cats because there are dogs, not cats. Um, okay, and um, at some point, okay, um, sorry about that. At some point, I told you that um, researchers had found that you can train a model only on hypothesis to, with really high accuracy, predict all uh, contradiction examples uh, correctly, which doesn't make sense. You have turned your um, task of predicting the relationship between these two sentences into a single sentence classification, uh, where we take just one of these. That doesn't make sense. You can't determine the relationship of two sentences if you never see one of the sentences. Uh, that, that task just shouldn't be possible, right? However, if we train only on hypothesis, we can achieve high performance, meaning not that the task in general is stupid and uh, doesn't make sense. It means that we develop data which uh, contains biases that makes this meaningless version of the task possible. We call uh, these kinds of baselines, heuristic baselines, and today, if you are developing a new benchmark, you would typically think of all the silly ways to approach your task and train a model in that fashion. And you want to demonstrate that if you train a model in that fashion, you get very low performance or very low usually means relative to your uh, random baseline. So if your random baseline is 33%, you want your heuristic baselines to also achieve around 33%. And a little bit higher than random baseline, is acceptable as long as there is still lots of room for improvement. So if your random baseline is 33%, but you get uh, your heuristic baseline achieves 40 40-ish percent, you can say in your paper, okay, we acknowledge there are some shortcuts here because of you know 10-ish percent of our data can be solved uh, in a silly way, uh, but there is still a lot of 60% of instances for which that is not possible. So improvements there are uh, you know, still meaningful. Any questions about heuristic baselines? 
Okay, so um, we at some point I probably mentioned that this definition of what is an artifact or a data shortcuts or spurious correlation in data, it's a it's a feature and with um, images feature is a pixel with text the feature is an input token. So input token, for example, is an artifact if there exists a correlation between a task label and that feature in your data, but not in the real uh, you know. Uh, occurrence of that uh, task in the real world. Um, and, and to illustrate that, uh, we can imagine we have a task where we need to classify um, these orange and blue uh, dots. And imagine this is the real distribution of that task in the real world. To solve that task, you need very complex decision boundary that illustrated with a red curvy line here. But when we annotate data, we can turn this very complex problem into something that's way simpler. And that's what happens with this um, NLI task in the SNLI data. By introducing the systematic uh, gaps with these data shortcuts, our task becomes such that simple, simple uh, solution exists for it. So, um, excuse me. Um, Okay, so this was just a little illustration of, of what's happening here. And uh, we also mentioned at some point there are two uh, types of data artifacts. One is granular, meaning your actual discrete feature in the input, meaning for NLP, your exact token in the input can uh, leak the label. So what happened here originally in the SNLI data set is that they started with an image captioning data set that's based on Flickr images. Uh, if you work in computer vision, you probably know that a lot of these data sets contain lots of images of dogs. So these annotators were instructed to, given this caption from this image, to write a new sentence that contradicts this image. Because there was a lot of images of dogs, a lot of captions mention dogs, the annotators find an easy pattern to turn uh, this sentence into contradiction by changing dogs into cats. And this is what happened here. A lot of hypotheses, examples that are uh, produced for contradiction simply mention word cats. So a model that sees cats ignores the premise and everything else in the hypothesis can determine that this is contradiction. Simply from the design of the data and simply from you know, the filtering of images that occurred in the, in the first uh, step. However, Artifacts or data shortcuts don't need to be so you know explicit. They can be a um, higher level feature of your input tokens. So in the same data set, if there is a high lexical overlap, meaning a lot of words that occur in premise also occur in a hypothesis, is very suggestive that the label will be entailment. So this is a little bit trickier because you can't maybe um, just do some corpus statistics to see whether you have that artifact. It can be really nuanced. And this is why those heuristic baselines are super important. Uh, if you train a powerful neural network on a silly version of your task, it will likely find those patterns that are hard to catch with your eyes manually. But the model can pick on these let's call them higher level statistics of your corpus. That's why they are important to, to demonstrate. So if you have an artifact that's actually more like a concept or higher level feature of your input, we talk about abstract data artifacts. And at some point I mentioned the methodology for using local explanations to maybe identify those artifacts. But my bigger point coming back to the, um, you know, making a trustworthy evaluation, examination to incur extrinsic trust from us into these models. The point I wanna make here is that our benchmarks might have these data shortcuts and our AI models might pass that evaluation based on uh, fitting those shortcuts, not because they are doing something smart that we expect from a model or human that should maintain that contract. So there is always this issue that um, the data itself might be um, unsuitable for, for the evaluation we want. 
All of that said, there is a progress has been made and now we know that these heuristic baselines should be reported and we are way more careful how we collect the data and now not data, excuse me, reviewers when they read the paper who develops data, check on these things. So you, the bar to producing a data set is actually pretty high these days. Uh, so I wouldn't say that now you should be extremely suspicious of every single test set that exists in the, out there, but you should also be very aware of these uh, these artifacts uh, if you are, you know, training tasks for certain application and you know what your test data is. So an easy solution here could be, well, just develop data that doesn't have these data artifacts, but this is way easier said uh, than done because if you're developing a new task, um, then you don't know what these artifacts are and methodologies for finding unknown artifacts are not bulletproof. They have, all of them have certain limitations. So it's really hard to, you know, collect new data and then use any tool you have at your disposal to say how, uh, you know, how many artifacts your data uh, contains, although there are certain methodologies like the one I have just uh, mentioned uh, that we have talked about before, where you can use your local explainability methods to find uh, some of them. Okay, I want to move to uh, next issue. So this is a good place to stop if you have any questions or any thoughts. How many of you were familiar with data artifacts before this? course, maybe raise of hands for those who were not. Okay, that's pretty substantial, um, which makes me happy that I'm talking about these things because I think it's really important to be aware of them. But then you can also think of in this now space of regulation of AI, when people talk about these things, how many people in those rooms don't know about stuff like that. So it's very easy to make very high claims about what AI can or cannot do when you don't know about all the failure modes about of our evaluations. Okay, um, a little side point before I move to the next um, issue is that um, I talk now about collecting data and there are data artifacts. And this also relates to the fact that there are two very distinct worldviews of how we should go about, uh, um, excuse me, go about collecting the data. So on the one side, we have people who say we should have strict qualifications for our annotators. So for example, typical thing to do is to have an exam and only if your annotators pass a certain rate like 80% or sometimes you might even want to impose 100%, you say they can annotate for you. Uh, you want to have less, you will have less annotators. You not, not necessarily want less annotators, but you will have because you have strict qualifications. Um, and you want to iteratively review data. This means we kick off the annotation in, in batches and we get the annotation for the first batch. Then we, collectors of the data, manually look through those examples and try to see, are our annotators using any, um, any are, are they overusing some patterns? So you can do some corpus statistics there. You can see in the collection of annotations you have, you can see whether some words are over represented or stuff like that. And if you notice, uh, and you will notice uh, any patterns or any, spammers or any annotations that don't really fit the instructions you were given, uh, you, you gave your annotators, you will send personalized feedback to those annotators. You will reach out to them and say, hey, you're doing good on these kinds of examples, but I noticed that you have been using this pattern or um, we have uh, very often comment we, we give them is, okay, this, this was great. These examples were great, but we noticed that now you, you're producing a lot of them and we just don't want any of those anymore. Thank you, please stop. And if you have responsible annotators um, and if you uh, have just a few of them, then you can easily filter them out until you get reasonable annotators. They're very responsive to these comments. They do want feedback and they do care about doing the best task for you. 
Um, so they are very responsive to these personalized feedbacks. And this is something that has been also emphasized in this paper as one really good strategy to uh, collecting uh, very quality, high quality uh, data. And in my personal experience with collecting this data, this has certainly been the case. Um, I mentioned this, that you manually ban or incentivize behavior. So if you see them doing something well, you might even give uh, your annotator bonuses to encourage that kind of creativity. All of this will result in slow annotations. If you are checking your data manually, it's going to take a while. So the last data set I have uh, participated in creating took seven months of annotations to uh, produce it, and it took 15 rounds of personalized feedback. But at the end of the day, we were really happy with the data and it wasn't sold uh, immediately, which is sometimes the case. People had released um, um, data sets that were sold in a month. And that's, as a data annotator, I think you will really, really want to uh, avoid. Okay, so another issue is that you're going to have smaller coverage, right? Because if you have smaller set of annotators, uh, there is as much of the phenomena of the task that they can produce collectively, but you will have better quality. On the other hand, we have a completely other world of people who want to have many annotators to increase that coverage. They want to have fast annotations and they are aware, aware that they are going to have less quality. So they are deploying strategies such as adversarial filters or denoising. So here are some examples of that. Model in the loop means that while your annotators are creating the data, you have the best model you have right now. And if you, 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 you are instructing your annotators to produce examples where this model will be incorrect. So they are adversarial to this model. They're trying to find hard examples to that specific state of the art. The issue here that has been highlighted is that this um, makes the annotation process a bit artificial. So if annotators are trying to create uh, the example for the task, having uh, fooling the state of the art in mind, that's gonna introduce some biases and it has been shown to introduce biases. Nevertheless, there is a whole line of benchmarks that are designed with this well called DynaBench. Um, yeah. Um, there is also something called data set cartography, where you take a model, you train it on your data, and you deploy certain uh, measurements such as the model confidence and, uh, and uh, others. And um, they propose the way to combine those statistics to map your data set into easy, hard, and ambiguous examples. And you can use this to produce uh, a data set that's going to be challenging uh, for the current models. So for example, v, uh, WNLI, not sure it's pronounced like that, deploys this uh, data set cartography where they find examples that are, I believe, ambiguous and hard to, to the model. And then they prompt GPT-3 to generate more examples that are alike those examples that are ambiguous and hard. Now, if you ask me, which worldview you should prescribe here, I can't tell you because I think both of these have their advantages and it's not necessarily that one approach is superior to the other. I have embraced this uh, first approach more in my own uh, recent work. I think these slower annotations really, um, really gives you control and power to create something that um, is really of high quality. So that personally has been uh, rewarding to me. However, I would invite you to check this workshop that has been uh, happening last year in one of the flagship NLP conferences, NACL, where there were many invited talks that from people that have these opposing views. And I think if you really watch them, you will understand why I don't want to give you a recommendation because um, they, they both make uh, a lot of sense. Okay, um, so this was a little digression, not so little. Uh, I want to move on to the issue number two, which is evaluations with um, independent test instances. So we all have, I believe, taken some form of machine learning class, and we have probably heard about the IID 
uh, assumption we are making that our instances are uh, identically and independently distributed, including our test set evaluation instances. And I will go back to the illustration I have shown you before, where we had this very complex phenomena in the world requiring very complex decision boundary, and we had annotated uh, data for it. Bummer, we had annotated it with a lot of systematic gaps due to data artifacts. And now our complex problem has been turned into a really simple one, which is human performance, superhuman performance like that. There is a blog there saying that uh, AI achieves superhuman performance in translation, reading comprehension, and you can't believe that's happening. You really want to avoid that. So again, solution, let's fill all these Points. And the issue is here is that if we don't deploy our model, we will never fill all the points, right? Because we simply don't know what will happen once we deploy the model. So before deployment, you cannot fill in the gaps. And then you can embarrass yourself if you release a model like this, uh, excuse me, like this into the wild, which had happened with the Microsoft chat in 2016 has been released, it's been really bad, started to uh, claim it's Hitler in a matter of 24 hours and it had to be shut down immediately. So we really don't want to be the ones who release models like that, right? So if we can't fill all the gaps, what we can do is for the evaluation instances we have, fill in the neighborhood around those instances and we should require that our models are correct in those local neighborhoods around each one of our evaluation point. If we had 100 evaluation points and we take their local neighborhoods, we still won't fill all the gaps, right? But think about how this simple, simple boundary here will behave. It will cross these blue points and it won't uh, be the proper solution for our task. So it's much better than assuming that our test instances are independent. Um, if it's not clear, if you are making um, these local neighborhoods around your specific point, you are intentionally violating the uh, assumption that your instances are independent because given a point, you are trying to find other points that depend on it. So. It's a deliberate violation of that assumption, which is why did we make that assumption? We made it because a lot of models work really well if we make that assumption, not because it's a, a realistic assumption to have for our evaluation data sets. Okay, so I wanna show you an example of how we can, how we can do this. Has this motivation been clear so far? All right. Oh. I don't know why it's lagging today. So this is a task of reading comprehension, meaning you have a passage or other piece of text and you need to answer a question in the context of this passage. Um, this passage has many things saying in it, but the important part is the one I highlighted in yellow saying nearly all of these guys' possessions were destroyed with the exception of a guitar and prize juggle automobile. And we developed this uh, data set to test models' ability to reason about implications of negation. Negation here is expressed with the exception of. Okay, so in this data set, we make those um, local uh, neighborhoods around this point by asking our annotators to make uh, three edits to this original passage with the goal to also cover these different skills that we, we the creators of this data, deem are necessary to test the model's ability to reason about negation. Specifically, uh, we make a first edit where we want to test whether the model can handle different ways of expressing the same uh, negation. So with the exception of, was by our annotator paraphrase into everything was destroyed, but a guitar and a prize Jaguar automobile survived. So we want to test whether, regardless of how you actually surface that negation, how you expressed it, the model can understand what's going on here. You also want to test that the model is sensitive to the scope of what is being negated. So here the annotator had changed with the exception of into everything was destroyed, including the guitar too, uh, with the exception of a prize Jaguar automobile. Now the thing that's being destroyed is just the car, not both the car and the guitar. Therefore the scope has changed. 
And finally, we want also uh, test the model's um, sensitivity to whether the negation was expressed or not. So we asked them to undo the negation. And here the annotator had removed uh, with the exception of and sentence says everything was destroyed, including a guitar and this car. So these are those points that are now close to the original passage. We still need some questions. So these questions, we ask them to target implications of negation as another way to overcome these um, data shortcuts. If your question has a high lexical overlap with any part of your paragraph, the model can localize the part of the paragraph that was important to answering that question. And very often, if the overlap is really high, uh, that part of the paragraph that's important almost entirely answers the question. So the task becomes very easy for our models. If you talk about implication of something that's expressed in this text, that means that it's not, the implication is not literally expressed in the text. So it's hard to model to just localize the relevant information and repeat it back to you. That was the motivation uh, behind the implication of negation rather than just about the expressed negation. So for example, here they ask, was Parsons able to use his Jaguar car after the fire? Um, so implication being, if it was not destroyed, then the, this person could have used their car after the fire, similarly with this guitar. And then um, the, the last one is, did they still have his Jaguar car in 1980 here? They have also need to exhibit some temporal reasoning and understand uh, that, uh, 1980 happens after 1973, and if the car wasn't destroyed, then they could have used it. Okay, so now important bit. Um, you are kind of making the cross product between these uh, answers and the uh, and all these questions. Instead of one question answer pair, you have uh, 12 uh, question answer pairs here, and you check uh, the model's performance. This um, is actually performance of the GPT models uh, last October, so about a year ago. And we see that some of these it will answer well, some of them uh, it won't answer well. And if you were uh, you know, calculating the accuracy, which is the most standard metric to calculate, where we uh, check the fraction of our answers that were correctly answered, then for you know a made up example of a bunch of these, um, you would calculate, okay, there are 36 question and some pairs here and mod my model answered 25, its accuracy is 70%, pretty good. I am, you know, not maybe if our goal was to achieve very high accuracy, we might not be super dissatisfied. However, if we calculate, um, how the model behaves in those local neighborhoods, I have illustrated with that uh, toy example. Then you would check um, for all these examples you have had, you would group them into bundles. Now there is there are options into how you, you can bundle them. You can uh, bundle have a bundle to be everything I showed you on the slide, those four uh, paragraphs and three questions, they're cross brother being 12 question and answer pairs, that can be a bundle. Uh, or it can be just for one question and those four passages. So actually it would be a bundle of four. Um, it, it is a choice you made. For the sake of the illustration, imagine that we bundle um, all questions about those four passages together. Um, and let's imagine the same scenario we had before with the accuracy of 70%. This is the exact same checks we had before. The only the last bundle will have all of the correct answers. So consistency here would be the number of fully co correctly answered uh, bundles over the number of bundles, which would be only one over three bundles, meaning 33%. So our highly accurate model in this example can have really low uh, consistency, showing you that if we have this uh, really rigorous uh, criteria for saying that the model is robust, namely that it should answer all of these uh, related questions in a closed neighborhood uh, correctly, then we would not be happy with the robustness of that model. Okay, so I started with saying, going all the way back, we are talking about the extrinsic, evaluate, extrinsic trust and we said, all right, we can um, have rigorous examinations uh, that if they themselves are trustworthy can incur extrinsic trust from all of us. 
And I said to you that the issue is that we have these test sets which have independent um, test instances where in the presence of data shortcuts, which are super normal thing to produce with the data, uh, can make um, very high uh, performance on the task meaningless. And I have showed you how we can circumvent this uh, specific issue by uh, evaluating and creating examples with bundles of lexically minimally different examples that themselves should not have artifacts, of course. And you're, you can say, okay, duh, this is, that's it. It's an issue doesn't exist anymore. Um, the problem here is that these kinds of evaluations with consistency rather than accuracy are not really mainstream in our community. So when you open a new large language model paper, you will never see mentions of any kinds of consistency, right? And your suggestion for how to circumvent that could be, well, let's just force all of these people's, people who develop these models to report the consistency instead of just accuracy. And we can all go to the president and say, listen, if we want to evaluate this safety thing, we better evaluate this in this way. I think that would be totally legit. But I think we should also acknowledge the fact that when we open these papers, the evaluations are ab abundant. There are pages and pages of evaluations. So to me, the solution is not to say to people who develop large language models, hey, you should have, you should evaluate this, this thing as well. Rather, I think we collectively as a community should decide on what are the, for the same evaluation budget we have, what's the best investment of that budget. And I think, doing a portion of what's already being reported and using a portion of that to report some of these consistency results would be better than spending all of the evaluation budget on many, 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 many evaluations of test sets with these, uh, where th these evaluation instances are independently sampled. Okay, uh, any questions of that? Obviously, these are all just my opinions. Um, uh, I really wanna say, Big Lebowski right now. Um, anyway, um, any any thoughts on this? Yep. The class you don't do it on more data sets to increase the data sets. So what, yeah, this is basically what I just said. You know, uh, we, we can say to, you know, meta developers, listen, when you develop Llama 3 uh, with that paper, I really want to see a uh, consistency evaluation on 12 contrast sets we have. And I, I just think it's unrealistic that um, everyone will have their own ideas of what they want to be, you know, reported in these together with the releases of large language models. So I, I'm sure they spent notable time and effort to get all this evaluation. Think about it, like MMLU and Big Bench both consists of, I don't know how many tasks exactly, but there are a couple of dozens of tasks in those benchmarks. So these companies, when they are evaluating their model, they already do evaluations on hundreds of tasks. So what I think would be a better proposal to them, a more cooperative proposal is to say, well, maybe we don't need to, you know, evaluate um, certain tasks in MMLU that we don't maybe deem more important than other MMLU tasks. And uh, maybe, you know, by the fact that we have filtered some of the MMLU tasks, we can use that time and resources, inference resources to evaluate some of these consistencies. So it's a, just a matter of, I don't know if politics is the right word for it, but kind of being more, cooperating than just saying uh, here is our evaluation wish list and you know making it ever ever uh, growing okay so I'm gonna move on then um, and talk about the next issue of our evaluation so that's that we are not ensuring uh, we are not breaking the basics. Um, so in 2020, ACL flagship NLP conference has awarded the best paper to a paper that had released so-called checklist, which is a methodology for verifying that NLP models uh, possess expected capabilities. And they include three different kinds of text, tests there. And one of these tests, um, family of tests is called minimum functionality tests. 
which check that the model handles well simple examples similar to uh, unit testing in software engineering that we are all familiar with. So to give you an example for the task of duplicate question detection, these are some of these minimum functionality tests they uh, propose. So they say uh, you can test temporal um, capabilities of your model by checking whether the model um, the figures out that these two uh, ways of phrasing the questions are different. Namely, is person X, did person used to be X, are two, two different things. So if uh, is this person an actress or whether they used to be an actress are two different questions. Um, Co-reference, for example, uh, figuring out uh, where the, uh, the, to who the pronouns refer to in the same question. Uh, and and so on. So there are a few of them. I don't want to uh, read all of them uh, out loud. But the point here is that they are very simple. You are just changing a slight, uh, changing things slightly. Okay. And uh, here um, is the performance of T five model. Remember that's one of our uh, popular encoder decoder transformers, pre-trained with a bunch of things and. It has been really popular, popular because it was, it came in a variety of sizes and it was open source. If you train uh, T5 on this task, you will see that, okay, the improvements increases slightly with the size, nothing spectacular, but things aren't breaking. Roberta base I'm showing here just because in the original checklist paper, they have used Roberta base. And now let's check the performance of this minimum functionality test I have shown you. You can see that, uh, First of all, um, if we compare our blue bar, which is Roberta base, uh, we can see that we have found some model that's way better at these minimum functionality tests than what we had in 2020. So in this way, this is kind of to praise ourselves for doing something right in the community. We have notably increased the model's ability to handle this uh, unit tests. However, um, Previously, I have shown you that you can have a model that's slightly better, right? Or at least we are not making it worse. But the performance on these unit tests can drop. So in the first uh, test, we see that from the size base, um, we are increasing. And then we have, excuse me, from the size small, to base to 3 billion, we are getting better and better and respecting these tests, which is great. Not only we are improving the model performance, we are also being more robust to these controlled examples, but then we have this dip. And sometimes this dip, like here for co-reference, can be pretty notable, can be pretty, pretty dramatic. So you have a model that's seemingly even better than the one you had before, but now you have broken its ability to handle very simple uh, examples. And um, that's kind of not great, right? Uh, that gives suggests to me that although we might be improving things overall in terms of the accuracy, if we look into whether we have broken things we had figured out before, it can happen that we actually have broken those things that we were handling well before. So again, solution here can be to, we have these checklists. It can be to just report a bunch of checklists. But again, that just makes the evaluation more cumbersome than it has uh, been uh, before. And again, I don't think us screaming at people who develop these things, why are you not reporting the checklist will not solve this. Um, I think we really need to figure out how to best uh, evaluate you know, number of these things with the, with the same uh, evaluation budget. Okay, was this surprising? Did you know about this before? You did not because we didn't publish this. <laughs> Does this make you sad? Like everything might be broken now. Yeah. Is it because bigger models are just giant tables? Giant what? Lookup tables. I don't think giant uh, models are just giant local tables. I don't think necessarily scaling means that uh, the ability to just repeat what's in the training data uh, had decreased. I actually 
with GPT-4, I have the you know best experience engaging with the language technology than I had ever before. Something has notably improved and is more useful than, than before. So I don't think they are just lookup tables. Uh, for the reason why this is happening, it has been reported that certain skills have so-called inverse scaling, meaning the more you scale your model, the model's ability to handle that skill becomes worse. And there is actually an uh, inverse scaling prize or award or competition. I don't know how they actually call it. And I don't know, is it happening yet? You can win a substantial amount of money if you find one of these inverse scaling um, skills in the models. The most, uh, I think, prominently or first one to be discovered is the ability to produce toxic uh, text uh, just increases. There is, um, if you, in an evaluation, a data set called Truthful QA. Uh, if you have certain conspiracy theories in that data set, the model's um, frequency of repeating those uh, more will be uh, higher with the larger model and so on. So there are a number of these. So it could be that these five and are and, and I pick these five amongst many of them could be that these are the ones that have exhibit these properties. So we should probably check this more thoroughly and see <laughs> whether we can win some money. Okay. Um, okay, the final issue with the constructing valid benchmarks is that um, the field is moving very fast and things get broken in the way of it. One of these things that can be broken is the evaluation uh, itself. So I wanna demonstrate that. And I will demonstrate that with the adversarial attacks. Now, you now all have heard about adversarial attacks probably because you have seen the paper where they add that little substring to, uh, to chat GPT, and then it prompts it to, to generate um, unsafe prompts. Um, here, I will ground this in a adversarial text for specific tasks, not for ChatGPT, which is a general purpose model, and not for safety or not safety. Okay, so adversarial attacks are methods that make automatically tiny changes to your text or image that do not alter. Um, this is wrong, so let me fix that. Uh, oh no, it's actually true. Sorry, I got confused. So you make tiny changes that will change a model's correct prediction. So model is originally correct, but then you tweak something and for the same instance, for its perturbed version, now it makes a mistake. And uh, the gold label, the true label is the same for the perturbed and for the true, uh, for the original instance. So with uh, images, this is easy to explain. You add small noise to your image. Your image still looks the same. Therefore the label, classification label is the same. If you had panda, it still looks like a panda. And uh, your original model had made correct prediction, predicting panda correctly. And now it uh, mispredicts it into, I don't know, a cat or another animal. And the way to evaluate your uh, attacks is to report the success rate, which is the fraction of example for which such edit of the input uh, alters uh, exist. I want to just give a little historical perspective here. Tiny change with images is easier to define because images are, um, you know, we can represent them with the pixel values. Pixels are continuous. Changing pixel values slightly will move you to a pixel that has similar color. With text, because text is uh, discrete, although we represent it with continuous vectors, this is not true. So if you add a little bit of noise to your embedding of your word, and then you move somewhere else in this embedding space, and you find the nearest um, vector that you have in your list of embeddings um, to that new vector you have produced, you might move to a word that completely changes the meaning of your text. So common example I give, if you have a sentence, birds fly, you change, you add a little bit noise to birds and you ended up to a vector uh, that's closer to a word dog. Now you have sentence that's meaningless, dogs fly. So what has happened in NLP is that there is this, you know, technical 
challenge in front of us, how to make this work in NLP. We love technical challenges. And then also there is potential to cause harm. So you kind of want to demonstrate, oh, this could happen and someone should fix it. Usually not me. So this, this two things combined have really urged people to work a lot of this, but sometimes um, not really looking into whether they are doing meaningful stuff. And let me uh, illustrate that. My hand is raised. Okay. Okay, so um, specifically, if your attack success rate has been measured as a fraction of originally correct examples, here IP means uh, IP uh, means uh, correct prediction, and IG means true gold label. So if two of these are same, that means that this is a correct prediction, and you check for how many uh, correct predictions the uh, prediction for the perturbed version of that example is incorrect, although for the original one was correct. And what this uh, measurement doesn't consider is that attacks should not change the true label. And prior work just assumed that this happens. They don't really check whether the true label has stayed the same. And as I said, with NLP, things can go very weird very, very quickly. So this shouldn't be guaranteed, but people assume it is. And then PriWorks does not consider the effectiveness of a large number of defenses that have been proposed for this model. So they want to you know, do a, propose a new attack method. In NLP, typically, they won't show how any defense uh, in, is effective on those attacks. Um, OK, so here I'm showing you. Uh, for five different attacking methods that are popular in NLP, um, I'm showing you the rate at which the true label of the perturbed example is changed. Each one of these points corresponds to the um, one attack model combination. We have 19 models and five attacks here. So there are 19 times five attacks here. And it really doesn't, I think, matter to really understand what the points are. Um, and then the i-axis is the label altering rate, which we measure with GPT-4. So basically, we take the perturbed versions of the of um, our examples for each model here and for each attack. So for example, this point here might be T5. So for we are attacking T5 with, let's say here, text fuller. And we give those perturbations we have created with text fuller for T5 to GPT-4. And we ask GPT-4 to tell us what the label is. Now, if the label from GPT-4 is different from what was the true label for the original example, we say that the label has altered. Otherwise, we say it did not. And we report the fraction of those that had altered. Reasonable question might be how good GPT-4 is in this. We find that it has a rate, error rate of about 13%. So this is not super clear cut, but it gives us a lot of information because we see that for this attack, BAE, the rate at which it produce, produces examples, attacks that change the true label is pretty high, sometimes close to 70% of the attacks have different label than their original instances. And if for 13% of them, or even 20% of them, GPT-4 was wrong, it still leaves about 50% of them, uh, half of them having the label that had uh, changed, which means that the core assumption has been violated with really high rate. So that's not good. Here I'm showing you the uh, success of an, an attacking method, uh, excuse me, a success of a defense. This defense is trained, it's a classifier which takes some representation coming from birth of your perturbed example, and you train it uh, to separate adversarial from um, true examples. Uh, so when it detects either real or adversarial example, it, show you, uh, it shows you um, 
it gives you a decision of whether that's a uh, attack or not. So if you are building a system, a reasonable thing you can do if you really care to not be attacked about, with adversarial attacks is to have a defense, right? As a part of your system. So here, again, we see a very high um, uh, success of our defense, uh, which means that a lot of these attacks, again, won't pass that defense and therefore will not be, should not be deemed as successful. Although this is not something these other works have been uh, actually um, looking into. And you can no notice that BAE that had previously violated the uh, that the fact that the label shouldn't altered is actually uh, producing examples that the defense can't attack, um, def defense can't recognize very well. Okay, um, way to handle the um, to for a defense to to handle examples is to just label everything as a as an attack, and then no attack would ever be successful, right? What's the problem with this then? If your defense labels everything as attack? Yeah, say it out loud. It's obvious, but. Exactly, so if you had ChatGPT with this defense, if it labels everything um, as an attack, it would be hardly useful. We see that uh, this defense we have deployed here does this with a rate of 10%, so not ideal. If you have really high state situation, I think this is fine. It's better to get a rejected one in 10 times rather than getting you know, attacked, um, getting attacked if you have a very serious application in mind. Okay, so a way to fix the ASR is to, uh, add two more conditions. So this is the condition we had before. And now we also add that the gold label, according to GPT-4, must be the same. And we also want our defense to fail on the example for the attack to be successful. So defense says this is a real, true, correct, original example, whereas it's actually attack. If you do that, and if your defense was trained on the known type of um, attack, then the SR, which was at the range of 90 to 100, becomes um, lower than 20%. So only 20% of your examples are truly attacked, although the previous method had suggested that 90% of the attacks are successful. And if you train uh, your defense on a very different attack type, so here we train the defense on an attack that changes words, and uh, we applied it to attacks that change single characters, so very different. You see that the drop in ASR is maybe not as spectacular. It's not from 90 to 20, but it's still notable drop, right? Now you have about, if you don't know what the attack type is, then about 40% of your attacks are successful, not almost 100. So that's a very different uh, perspective. So yeah, evaluations of robustness are not robust was my point here. So if our contract is that our model has to be robust to adversarial attacks, and we say that you know uh, AI can pass only if it's able to do that, we will get way more models able to do that with the old ASR than in reality than uh, they can do. So this really uh, again you know changes what is um, passing that evaluation for the extrinsic trust. Um, similarly, I want to come to the point that our pre-training became more involved. I have mentioned that in 2020, we had addition of instruction fine tuning. And that means that we take a bunch of tasks, say 18 hundreds of tasks and all of their data. Now think about it. If you had thousand instances for each one of these 18 hundred tasks, and we probably have way more, you have only almost 2 million instances. And you fine tune your model with it. This is a super common practice today. It's used for, for example, LAMA2 model that you have used uh, in your homework. So if you had 2 million labeled examples you have used, that are produced in the community that develops evaluation benchmarks, what is out of domain uh, anymore? And out of domain is, is the main robustness property we want to measure um, 
or it's often cited in research that we want to measure. So very, very easily you can deem you are evaluating out of domains if you didn't check whether your test set that you deem out of domain is part of the instructional fine tuning. So it's a very easy way to, to think you are evaluating out of domains where you're actually evaluating in domains. And this is, I think all of what I said here stems from the fact that we are simply moving very, very fast. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's an easy fix. It's almost like a culture thing. And I am not a promoter of super slow science either. I think there is clear benefit of uh, producing and innovating quickly, but there is, I think a range here and maybe, maybe things are moving slightly too fast right now. Okay, so this brings me to the end of uh, these, uh, you know, extrinsic human trust in AI evaluations. And I just wanted to demonstrate to you how many issues might occur uh, if we want to use our evaluations to show to someone, hey, uh, under my evaluation, this model is passing this uh, ability, you know, is passing um, the criteria to maintain this contract. Therefore, you should trust it and be probably convinced. So, you know, I wish this is something that's easy to show to the public, you know, um, because with knowing all this issue in mind, we might be actually increasing warranted distrust, which is maybe also something that's uh, needed. Okay, so I want to use uh, the time I have to also, I, I brought up the idea of contracts, right? And this can be, be said be many things. And I think a lot of things uh, that are part of, you know, big discussions around uh, AI today are around retraining data. Um, namely, we would like to ensure high quality data. And here I took the tweet from this uh, researcher because I think they capture what the problem with uh, pre-training data uh, is really well. Namely, they say, you know, it's there is a lot of mysticism around the pre-training data. And there is this, um, term called a documentation depth that was coined in the stochastic um, period paper that has you know, um, been uh, widely uh, discussed in, I think, 2020. What documentation depth says is as your data becomes so large, you have less ability to document what's in that data. And we are when we are in this field that rushes and we all wanna be at the top of, you know, whatever, leaderboards of uh, large language models, uh, we will certainly not prioritize documented data. So we don't have, you know, Palm 2 or GPT-4, we don't have any, any information about what's in that data. Pre-training itself is very expensive. It's a process that costs lots of money. I don't know the exact figure, but it's in millions. And um, it lasts for a long time. So pre-training without instruction fine tuning can last uh, six months, which is a lot. So you don't do pre-training experiments often, right? And the way we kind of figure out what are the best data procedures, if we were just fine tuning, is to do a bunch of experiments and see what one, which one works the best. This is not something we can do with pre-training. So. This person uh, has summarized everything really well by saying, so public data choices are largely guided by intuition, rumors, and partial uh, information. Um, I also want to highlight that since the data is huge, the analyses are really small. So for example, you might want to measure the vector similarity of your query with all the pre-training data uh, vector representations, and that would take a ridiculously long time to do. Um, and we have all read the paper about how finding influential examples is also really, really small. They had to deploy heuristics that themselves were unsure about to be able to produce any influence. Data filtering should that be done with care. So if you deploy some quality filters, they can improve performance, which is good. That means that right now there is this currency that's a uh, very informal in pre-training world, which says you need one trillion tokens to train pre-train your model. But um, if you can produce higher quality data, maybe that one trillion isn't really necessary uh, given the uh, you know evidence we have from this paper. There are also toxicity filters. You filter um, 
data points that exhibit toxic text. And uh, they have, they trade off uh, with their ability to reduce risk of toxic generation. So if you remove the, um, the uh, toxic data contraintuitively, uh, the ability to identify I mean, not contradictively, uh, you can identify toxic texts text less and therefore uh, without having done a powerful toxic text identification model, you will generate more toxic texts and that's what's contraintuitive. Um, in our paper, we have also mentioned the point of, in this paper, we have looked into the in T5's pre-training data. So there they had, use C4 data set, which is for, you know, entirety of uh, common crawl. And they deployed a checklist of so-called naughty words, which involved words like LGBTQ or queer. Um, and their idea was that, oh, these models are known to produce very harmful text around LGBT community. So better erase all that text from the data. So it never has a chance to say anything bad about them. Well, half what happens if you remove any mentions of LGBTQ people in the, in the on the web, your model just erases all the voices from those communities. So that's an issue as well. It's not, the filtering data is not a solution to erasing, uh, you know, uh, disabling your model to generate uh, types of data that you don't want. So what has happened is that to audit these uh, data sets, um, people had to also deploy manual strategies. So if you look into data that was used to train stable diffusion, uh, it has a lot of pornography involved in it. And then researchers who look into this data had to deal with a lot of that. And that's a burden that a lot of time goes uh, not acknowledged uh, in our community. Okay, so there is also an issue of, you know, not every person, and I know some of you personally, you do want to train useful models and you do want to do right by people who develop the training data. So this is what I coined developer's dilemma. You have, you want to make useful models. You know the community that will benefit from these models and you really want to make positive social impact. But you need the data. You just you know that your model is going to simply work better if you use a pre-trained model and you fine tune it. Um, so what should you do? You want to respect the fact that this pre-training data already has certain information that your you know people you are building this for that community doesn't want to be violated. But you do know that you you need it um, to train a useful model for them. So, so how to achieve both of these simultaneously? is a hard question, but I don't think necessarily impossible one. I think there are ways to go about this and it's very, and it's very, very stages. I can't tell you all of the details of this paper, but this is one example of trying to achieve that. So this, is, this paper is called Silent Language Models, where you are training your model on the data where you have permissive licenses such as CC uh, BY. And you have a data set of the data that is copyrighted. And you use that data only at the, um, at the inference time. Um, so we know now know about in-context learning. So we know we can use add the examples as our demonstrations in our inference time. So we, can, we have ability to never train on that data, just use it to make better inferences. So if these people come and tell you, listen, I really do want not want to uh, you to use my data, or if you are in Europe and GDPR says, hey, this guy stole, delete your delete their data, now you have ability to do so because this is non-parametric. This is just like a database, so you can remove it and never use it for inference again. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is kind of cool that we have at least some researchers not only thinking about this but thinking about this deeply enough to develop. Uh, technical solutions. And this is probably, I didn't write the paper too careful to tell you what are the limitations of it. It probably has some limitations like any other research paper, but it's good that we are producing ways of dealing with this. I think this is a great research area if you're interested in it. Okay. And I want to finish uh, with, you know, gossip. Uh, so there are some opinions in the community about um, the fact that we need data. So how many of you know what a fair use uh, fair use is? Can you raise your hand? Okay. All right. 
So for those who haven't heard what, what FOIA use is, um, you can use, uh, in terms of technology, there have been uh, certain trials where people had sued, for example, Google, saying that uh, Google should not deploy data mining techniques on their data. And um, the fair use argument emerged that said, no, this is fine. You can, you can uh, use other people's data uh, as long as those who are, you know, um, who would do the task, such as, for example, let's take an example of artists. If you're not putting those artists, um, if they are not losing job because of you. And of course, there is some leeway, like technology had left so many people without, um, without you know, jobs. So I, there was probably some, you know, more lengthy legal description of what does it mean to, you know, um, disable a group of people to, to keep doing their job. Um, but as long as you are doing that, this is considered fair use. You could use that data to train a model, get the outputs. As, as long as those outputs are not putting these people out of job, that should be fair use. And now with generative AI, it can be, became a little bit tricky, right? Because, um, and I think that also there is here, there are some misconceptions and unfortunately the way people write about, talk about papers. So there has been a paper that examines stable diffusion and how, how you can get the exact same copy of an image from stable diffusion. And people had widely shared this paper as if they are saying you can copy every single training example. What they showed in that paper, you can um, copy exactly about hundred images from 175 million images. So if not, you know, to me that paper shows that this is a really rare occurrence and it has then been another paper have, or maybe them themselves have showed that this happens if you're coping, if you have multiple occurrences of the same image in your data. So if you deduplicate your data, this rate becomes even lower. Um, so, I don't want to, you know, say that this is not an issue, but the exact coping of the data doesn't happen with a really uh, large rate. Okay, so people who develop open source are afraid that this fair use argument is going to go away, which is um, might be a little bit confusing, knowing that open source community is the one that actually care about these people. If you have close company, you don't really care, honestly. I mean, I think that's fair to say. So it's a little bit conundrum because you have open source community caring about these people, but then themselves want to keep the fair, uh, fair use argument. And what's behind all of this is that the close companies such as OpenAI, Anthropic, Google DeepMind, what they have at this, their disposal is a lot of money. So what they can, and they have a lot of lawyers as well. So what they can do is two things. They can um, buy all the data, push all these uh, artists and say them, I'll give you good money, just give me your data. And you know, people will do it, why not? Uh, another option is to a license, get the license for all the data. This is a nightmare because, and I think I, I have put it somewhere, people I, I engage with, they said this would be a nightmare and huge losing battle because that would mean that you need to engage with every publisher, with every, every publisher, news publisher, scientific journal publisher, ev every single publisher, you need to negotiate license with them. So people in open, uh, people in open source do think that this fair, uh, fair use argument are gonna stick around. Uh, but there is also this, you know, you know um, if, if it happens so that the, it goes away, they, these companies might not only license or buy data from the creators, they can go and create the data themselves. So you have all heard that uh, OpenAI has paid uh, their annotators in, I believe, Kenya, only $2 per day because they didn't want to disrupt local economy. Uh, and rumors are that they are already at the ability to have a data set of 1 trillion tokens. Um, so this is conceivable. Also, remember that I told you that the higher quality data, you don't need one trillion tokens of it. So if you want to buy data from people directly, that might be also the choice. Who doesn't have this money? We don't have this money. Uh, so that's an issue. Uh, and, you know, my reaction to all of this is why National Science Foundation then doesn't, you know, invest this money in, in you know, make people who care about open source create it. Um, you know, NSF, if you, at some point in your career, some of you will become professors and you will know how much money 
NSF funds every year. So idea of spending 20 million to create a 1 trillion tokens won't become crazy to you because you know how much money goes to other things anyway. Uh, but there is a big skepticism that this would uh, ever happen. So yeah, if free, free use uh, argument is not applied to outputs of generative AI, that, that will be a huge hit for open source. So yeah, you all live in a very strange time in our research of this uh, technology. I recommend to, to you know, be involved in these things, to think about them because, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the only way for people deciding on these matters to know what to do is, is everyone um, is involved. Okay, so I will end up with that. Uh, hopefully it's motivational. All right.